us talking. It's going to be really good. There's no presentation. Um, okay. So, welcome everybody. This is always going to be the elected or the sounding more persuasive. Ultimately, we're going to, I think, have, it's going to be a little bit more of a conversation in some sense. I'm really going to uh, have, I have a list, up, I have a list up here that, you know, I compiled or whatever we're going to talk about, that are some little, some little ways to make you sound more persuasive when you're talking about things. And they're very, very, very basic. In fact, I said one uh, the other day that we'll talk about uh, that I don't actually have here. In fact, let's see what No, none of you wrote that to me. But that's okay. But ultimately, I also want some feedback from you. I want to, I want to know like what is it that you find that you struggle with when trying to be persuasive? Is it just is it just a language thing? Is it just that uh, like English is not your first language and so therefore it's sometimes difficult to uh, be persuasive, to use rhetoric in a similar way? Or is it just that perhaps some of these things are not anything that you've ever thought of before, or never thought of being important to do? Most of the time, persuasion is very basic. Does anyone have a definition, perhaps, of persuasion? Like, what do you think that it means? Or what is it? Not a formal definition, but like, tell me what persuasion is. To make people believe in something, okay. What well, what else? There's more to it. There's plenty more to it. It's not just that you're trying to make them believe, but you're also trying to convince them, perhaps, that uh, not even necessarily that they're incorrect, but just that there are things that are more important. But ultimately, think about the way that uh, a person who sells things, people who are salespeople, are very persuasive that they convince you that you want to buy something. But it's not just that they convince you that you want to buy it. It's that they convince you that you wanted to buy it. That you already had that desire. They just showed it to you. They just explained to you that you have that desire, and so therefore, you now want to buy it. Think about any advertisement that you've ever seen. Advertisements are arguments. All advertisements are arguments. They're all an argument for you buying that product. Every time you see any type of advertisement, when they, perhaps it's, you know, a very, very young person who is drinking with a Coca-Cola, and they're having a fun time, they're partying, and they have lots of friends. And the argument that's being made is that Coca-Cola would do that for you. Drinking the Coca-Cola would give you that experience. You would have fun. And because you want to have fun, you want a Coca-Cola. And that's ultimately what persuasion is. Advertisements are a very good thing to look at, in fact, when you're trying to understand what's persuasive and what's not, and how you can play on the ideas that people already have. Because what we've been teaching you so far, this almost probably the entirety of, uh, of this training, or uh, yeah, this training camp, is that you know you have to you have to argue, you have to there has to be a structure, there has to be a claim, you have to support it, and then there has to be a conclusion. And the people who do that best are the ones who are going to win. And that's going to be true quite often. But if you're also persuasive, if you also are able to stand up here and say things in a way that is more convincing than just, well, we believe, we believe this thing, and it's important, and I'm going to give you a couple reasons why. And you know, you're down here, you're looking down, and you're like, this is important because we think the economy is good and people do better when there's, when there's a strong economy. None of you are interested in it. None of you just, like, probably none of you even listened to what I just said because I was looking down, because I was talking low, because my voice didn't alternate at all. It sounded as though I was on a computer. And that's not what you want to do. When you want to persuade someone, you're also trying to make sure that you're capturing their interest for the entirety of the time that you're speaking. Because part of being persuasive is making sure that the message actually is received. You could get up here and make the best speech you have ever made. It was beautiful. It was argumentatively strong. You had every example that you could 
possibly think of. And it was great. You were feeling so good. And then you looked up to realize that the judge had headphones in. They didn't hear a word that you said. And then they asked you to do it over because they weren't paying attention. That's, okay, hopefully that never happens because that would be an awful judge, right? Like, that would be the worst kind of judge to have had headphones in at all. But the idea is that you want to make sure that the message is received. And part of the way that you make sure the message is received is by changing and varying the way that you pace your voice. By sometimes getting louder and then sometimes maybe even like getting quieter, getting quieter and speaking slower. Because if someone were to walk in here with a booming voice, they came in here and they're like, everybody, welcome! And you had been sitting there and you were like, not really paying attention, you weren't really sure what you were doing here, but then you, you know, this person walks in and they were like very loud, very booming voice, and you just look up and you're you're attentive right then and there. You want to know what they're going to say next. And so two things have happened quite often in many of the debates that I've seen. People have not, not started their speech very strongly. And they also have not finished their speech very strongly. And what you really want to do when you're going to start your speech is not, like, if you're coming up to right here, because this is where you're this is where you want to speak. You don't want to come up and as you do, just start speaking. You want to be like, and so we're the Prime Minister and I'm going to talk to you about. It's not what you want to do. It's not very persuasive. The reason that's not very persuasive is because it doesn't look like you're set. It doesn't look like you want to be up here. If you take your notes, and you're, you come up here, you set it down, you look up, make sure everyone's ready, press the start button on your timer, and then you start. And you start in a way that is strong, with your voice really projecting, with everyone able to hear you, and know exactly what it is that you want to talk about. That's a very good idea. And it's a better idea to make sure that you've set everything down, collected yourself, and then begun. Same thing with finishing. You don't want to finish your debate speech with you know, people tapping on the table, wanting you to sit down, being like, you, you have spoken so far over time. You want to finish your debate speech in between the double bang and before that third, like when the judge bangs on the table three times. If you have to, if you have to finish after that, that three bangs, it's like maybe five seconds more. That's really the most leeway you're going to get. Because ultimately, the message that you're sending by speaking over that time is that, excuse me, is that you weren't able to say everything that you needed to say in the seven minutes that you were given. It looks like you were unable to do what you had to do within the seven minutes that you were allotted. And so it becomes much less persuasive the longer you go. And think about it. Think about every time that you're going to end an interaction with somebody. Let's say two friends, you know, they, they go out and they have, they have a fun time, but then at the very end, it, it gets bad, like something ridiculous, something silly happens, or you have a little argument, and then you, and then you leave. You leave after the argument, you say goodbye, and that's it. The, you know, what ends up happening is, at the end of that evening, you remember the argument most probably. That ends up being the thing that was most important, because it was negative, because it was bad because it was at the end, and there wasn't any more time for good things to happen. The same is true of your debate speech. You want to end your speech right when you want it to be done. You don't want anyone to tell you to have to get to go and sit down. That's not good. That's really, in fact, it's very bad. Ideally, you have a final line, like a concluding sentence, a sentence that will end your debate speech, that after you hear a double bang, you can get ready to say. Then you can say it, and then you can just look up and say thank you, and then sit down. Because then it looks like you're in control. It looks like you know exactly what you're doing. You look comfortable, and you look confident. And because you look comfortable and confident, the judge is going to probably look at you better. They're probably going to look at your other arguments and say, okay, that's good. Because there's not any silly concerns that you weren't able to do it in the full seven minutes, that you had to go for an extra 40 seconds that everybody else didn't get, okay? So this is the basic idea of, the, of things that you can do to be more persuasive, just within the structure of your speeches. In 
when you're going to introduce them and when you're going to finish them and go and sit down. Because those are the two times that are most awkward, right? Additionally, there's something that people do, and I haven't seen much of it, but there's something that people do quite a bit in, uh, well, especially in America. Beginner, beginner debaters in America will oftentimes make a speech. They'll get up here, they'll give you a speech. It'll be all right. It won't be the best. They'll know things that they could have done better. They just, you know, they're still new. They're still very good to debate. And so they'll finish, and then they'll, then they'll sell off, right? They'll, they'll look down. Their body language will say that they think that it was bad. And they'll get over there, and their partner will be like, uh, you know, they'll say to their partner, that was the worst thing that I've ever done. Like, they'll be very angry. Not angry, but also disappointed. Because they'll think that they've done a bad job. And if you think, or if you think you've done a bad job, in the debate round, you should hide it. You don't want the judge to also think that you think that you did a bad job. Because if I'm judging a debate and I think that you did a bad job, I'm curious. They weren't confident about that. They didn't think that was good. Why not? What was it about that speech that they didn't like so much? So if you're not expressing confidence when you're walking up to the podium and when you're walking away, it's not, again, it's not something that would ever be said to you. It's not as though a judge is ever going to say something like, in fact, if they did, they would be a horrible judge. They shouldn't ever say to you, you lost the round because you looked like you were upset at what you said. That shouldn't happen. But if you want to be more persuasive as far as the speaking as far as speaking goes, and you want to make sure that the judge has no questions about what you thought about your speech, then you walk off with confidence. You say thank you, we oppose, or something like that. And then you walk off and you smile and you say, yeah, that's right. Like that's what you do. You know, you get up there and you like you really own the space. It's yours. When you get down, your partner, you high five, and you're like, that was the best. And maybe it was the worst, maybe it was awful, maybe you only spoke for two minutes. But you still do that because you make sure that the judge knows that you think that you are doing a good job. And that's very important because it's also true in, you know, I mean, again, all of these things that we've been telling you, teaching you, and engaging with you about are all applicable in real life as well. This is true in social situations as well. If you approach something with no confidence, People aren't going to necessarily respond positively. And so being confident in what you're going to say is going to be important. Now obviously there are limits, right? Like maybe you don't high five, you don't want to be very ostentatious, does that make sense? You don't want to be you don't want to be showing off or anything like that. That's not the idea. But it is to express that quiet confidence of saying, yeah, that was good. You you put you as you come to sit down, your partner pats you on the back. And if the judge happens to see it, then it'll be good. But it's a good way of approaching it. Because it means that you recognize that not everything is life or death. Not everything. Like, if you lose the debate, it's not the worst thing in the world. If you win the debate, it's also probably not the best thing in the world. But it's good. And it's maybe a little bad to lose. But if you approach it with that mindset of recognizing that you're performing almost, you're going up here, you're giving a speech, because you're not always talking about what you believe in. You're not always explaining exactly what you think and why you think it. Sometimes you're saying what other people think. Sometimes you're saying the opposite of what you think. And so getting up here, acting that part of the show is also a good idea. So, with that said, there's one more general thing that I want to say about persuasion, then we're going to get into like actual examples of like how you can be like specifically express more knowledge and sound even better in, in some particular rounds. One other thing to note is that, especially in a tournament setting, if you're at, at a competition, if you're at a competition and you already spoke, you've given your debate speech, and then the judge looks up and sees that you're like playing on your phone, it's a temptation that we all have, but you should definitely avoid it. You should definitely, like, if they see that like, you're on Facebook, Facebook, but you know, you know, Zhen Zhen, is that right? Is that it? Yeah? Got it, I think. Brenda? Who knows? Anyways, that. If you're on, if you're on that, if you're, or if you're reading something, that's, that looks disrespectful to the other debaters in the round. 
it looks like you couldn't be bothered to care about what they're saying. It looks like you're not engaged anymore in the debate. So why should I, as a judge, give you first place if you're not even engaged in the round, if you don't even care about what's happening in the rest of them? So that's another thing to just be aware of, especially in a competition setting. Because if you're in that competition, you want to be doing everything. You want to be doing everything you possibly can to make sure that you're going to win. And that's absolutely one. It is surprisingly common how often people will pull out their phones and will just start playing around during the debate. Not, I'm not saying here, I just mean generally. Generally speaking, it's very common. I've watched many debates, and it happens more than you would think. And you just look over, and you say, what are, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? That's not good. That doesn't help you in any way. It doesn't make you more effective. If it doesn't make you more effective in that debate round, you should not be doing it. Okay. Are there any questions on any of that? Good. This is good. So, let's look at a couple, by a couple, I mean, quite a few, uh, examples of, I'm going to call them tricks. I'm going to call them persuasion tricks, because that's ultimately what they are. It's really a matter of, it's really a matter of framing what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. So a good example of this is going to be a first one, where what you can do, if you have, if you know a country, right, and you know who the leader of that country is, then sometimes if you have to, if you have to talk about what that country is going to do, let's say you're going to say that uh, the United States should invade Syria, or should militarily intervene in Syria. And now you could keep saying over and over and over again, that, well, the U.S. government, the U.S. government, the U.S. government. But then you could also refer to it as, say, the country's capital itself, as what they're doing, as what they're going to do. So it's much different, and it sounds like you know quite a bit more if you say something like, Washington, D.C., which is the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., should, should plan to invade militarily in Syria. Something along those lines. Or like, London should do this policy. London should join. Because it sounds like it's more specific. It's somewhat more specific. And so if you talk about the country's capital as doing the action, because that's where, that's where of course, like their legislative buildings, that's where they would be making the decisions to do these things, whether or not to invade in Syria, whether or not to give more money to North Korea, things like that, they would be deciding them in their capitals. And so by using that as a way of kind of implying that you have more information than you might actually have. It's a good way of going about it. People would be a little surprised and say, oh, they know what they're talking about. That's great. In the same way, <coughs> then you can refer to the political leader of the government as the, as the government itself. So you can say something like the Obama government. The Obama government really should do something. You know, it could be that. It could be something like uh, the Brown government, the Brown Parliament in, uh, in England, things like that, or Merkel in Germany. You know, Merkel's government should do this. It allows people to think that you have a little bit more information than you otherwise might have. Because it's something that you know, but it sounds like you know quite a bit about Germany. It sounds like you know quite a bit about the United States. Because you know the capital, you know the leader. You know, those are pieces of information that you know that you can deploy strategically in your debate speech in order to make it sound like you have quite a bit of information. The same is true of, Syria, of the actual country of Syria. If you know the name of Shah al-Assad as the leader of Syria, then you should figure out a way to say that in your debate speech about Syria. Because it sounds like you know more than just the fact that Syria is a country. It sounds like you also know that you know the leader, you know the conflict, maybe you know bad things that he's done, maybe you know about his political beliefs. I start to then question as a judge, and other people in the round, the opposition maybe, start to question just how much you know. It makes them think that if they were going to make up a fact about Syria, they would think twice about it, because you might know it, you might know it to be true or false. And so that's the idea behind that. So if you're going to be like, we would invade, Syria, 
then you want to mention Bashar al-Assad. You want to mention what you know and figure out the best way to imply that you have a very good understanding of the situation if you don't. So those are two. Those are two basic ones. Uh, the other ones are uh, a little different. So let's think of something like word choice. Word choice is pretty important because words have connotation. They have, they either mean, they sound like they're good or they sound like they're bad, even though they mean the exact same thing. So for example, you should use, you should choose your words to also try and imply the meaning behind them. So an example of this is the reign of someone. Barack Obama's reign as president of the United States sounds far more, sounds awful actually, that sounds very awful, is, but it's much different than saying Barack Obama's tenure as president. And the difference is reign has a much harsher sound. It sounds like he's done something negative in a way that he probably didn't, or maybe he did, or maybe you think that he did. But if you're trying to characterize Barack Obama's government as being not good for America, as being bad for America, then you would say something like the reign of the Obama administration. You wouldn't say a word that has a more positive or at least a neutral connotation, like tenure. Same way that you would do something like regime versus, versus administration. So the reign of Barack Obama's regime sounds much worse than the tenure of Barack Obama's administration. One of those sounds very negative. It's obviously the first one. The first one sounds very negative. It sounds almost a little dangerous. It almost sounds like you should be a little bit afraid. And that's how word choice is very important within the context of the debate round. Because in particular, if you, if you say things and you want to describe them in a way, there are sometimes words that will help you describe them, that will save you time. They're almost shortcuts. Because if I want to say that Barack Obama's administration is bad, I have to do quite a bit of work. I have to say, I have to give many examples. But if I've already made you think that the reign of Obama's regime over America has been negative, by using those words, you already probably think that it's bad, and that you at least already know what to expect from what I'm going to say next. Another example of this is something like bias versus the word perspective. So if I say that you are biased against women, that's one example of something that I would say. It sounds very negative. But it could just be that you have a very interesting perspective on women. Now, in this instance, I'm pretty sure that the perspective is also going to be bad, and that's going to be negative. But, bias versus perspective, they kind of mean the same thing. Maybe you're biased, or maybe you view things in an interesting way. You know, so if... The idea, of course, here is that you're trying to describe to me what you're saying, through the language that you're using. And the words that you choose are going to have important implications for how I interpret what you said. Okay, now that we've got some heavy ones, let's do some more minor ones, okay? Are there any questions yet? Or 
maybe not even necessarily corrupt, but certainly uh, maybe very ambitious and interested in power. And so, if you say something like the reign of, because like the usual the usual saying is something like the reign of terror, and so it sounds bad. It sounds very negative. And so once you say the word reign, like no one talks about the reign of prosperity. That never happens. And it's largely because they're, it's associated with very negative things, rather than being associated with positive things. And so that's that's very interesting that you wouldn't notice much of a difference between those two. Because you're probably because the definition is very similar, right? Oh, I mean, what do you mean by the difference between words? Is this sound or the meaning? Because I know regime has many when we refer to God things. But uh, I, I first understand your point as uh, it is the difference between how they pronounced, how they how they sound. Like yeah, so it's not that it's not even that there's a different definition of the words, it's more that is more so the sound the sound of the word, but also the first images that kind of pop into your head when you hear the word. So another so a good example is like words that have that mean the same thing but have a different emotional impact. If someone says describe something as a sexual assault, that sounds very different than saying the word rape. Even though they can mean the same exact thing. And so that's kind of the same idea that there's a distinction between what, like, what is going to, like, the word that you're using, in one case, has a very negative connotation, probably rightfully so, but the other one sounds a little bit more, almost scientific, you know, it almost sounds like, you know, it's not nearly as, uh, it's descriptive, and it'll tell you what you mean, but it doesn't have that same, the same bad things associated. Does that make sense as far as how that, that's how the difference kind of manifests within itself. Um, so another good example actually of you know, the ways that words have the same, the same definition but different meaning is that uh, in something that's happened uh, very recently is that many soldiers who come back from wars get diagnosed with something called, that we now call uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what they call it now. And it's because we have much more information about it. But it used to be, I think, I want to say after World War I, it's after World War I, after either World War I or World War II. World War II. Hmm? I think it's World War II. Well, well, so after, but after one of them, there was a difference, so maybe it was World War I, in fact, that uh, the word, the way that they would describe it, the same syndrome, was called shell shot. Shell shot. Which sounds like very harsh, very negative. It sounds like you know, it sounds like you could have controlled it in some ways. And so if that's a much harsher way of describing post-traumatic stress disorder by saying, oh, that he is shell shot. And so this is how, like, this is what, these are the ways that words can be, they mean the same exact, or they have the same definition, but they are going to have a different meaning if you say them, because the context of those words are very important. So, okay, any other questions on, on those ones? Okay, so, let's go through a couple more easier ones, ones that are very easily correct. If you get up here, and you're about to, and you're about to talk, you shouldn't touch your face during your speech. Your hands shouldn't be up here. You shouldn't be doing things like this. And you know why? It's distracting. This is very distracting. And people sometimes just forget. They don't even realize that they're doing it. And so, a good, it's again, very easy to correct in that you can just ask your partner to watch the way that you speak. And if they notice that you do things with your hands, that are distracting, that aren't just hand gestures. But you know, you're like, you're moving around and you're giving your speech. This is distracting. This is a very distracting thing because 
people don't know what to do. It also looks like you're not grounded in what you're saying. And that's the second piece of advice with regards to this. Your feet should basically be planted. You really shouldn't be walking around much like this, like stepping forward, stepping back. Lots of people do this as well, where they just, this is how they play. They will give a bass speech, just by rocking back and forth, sometimes side to side, or sometimes just rock, just like this, and give a bass speech. This is what you should try to avoid. Because by doing those movements, you are going to distract. You're going to distract away from exactly what it is that you want to talk about. Okay. One of the last ones, and this is actually what I'm going to say quite a bit of, is that when you get up here, when you get up here, you shouldn't have a pen in your hand or a pencil. Because if you, if you're doing this, if you have a pencil or a pen, you're often, you're going to play with it in all likelihood. You're going to do things like switch hands. Again, this is equally distracting. You shouldn't, you definitely shouldn't. Hmm. You definitely shouldn't write anything down, in particular, while you're up here. Uh, either before, certainly not during your speech, but definitely not before either. Because once you get up here, the idea is that, the idea is that you're ready to speak. You shouldn't need any more time. And so if you get up here, and you're ready to give your speech, but then you're writing a couple more things down. Number one, you're making everybody else wait for you. And that's not a good thing to do, because then everyone is going to be a little bit less persuaded by you. But also, you want to get up here and be ready to start. You don't want to have to write down anything more. So that is something that you should definitely try to avoid if it's something that you know that you do. Because it will also help you use your prep time, any of the prep time that you have, you use it more effectively as well. Okay, the next thing, the next thing here, is to differentiate between the speaking style of the person who went before you and your own. Not in the sense that you should change the way that you speak, but oftentimes there are people who will speak before you who will have a very different way of speaking. They will be very loud and they will be very fast. That's a possibility. They could stand up here and say, we think it's important because, and they'd be that loud for the entire speech. And it would feel like you're being yelled at. The judge would be like, why are you yelling at me? And they would be upset. Not upset, but they would be confused. They would not, that message doesn't come back or like sink into them in the same way. Because the way that it was delivered was too over the top, it was too, hard to listen to in some ways. There's more work. So if that happens, if someone before you has that type of speaking style, then it's very good if you come up here and then you come up to present your case in a slower and a little bit more even-toned manner. But you say, we believe that this is very important. It sounds like you're definitive. It sounds like you are in control. Whereas the other speaker sounded like they were out of control. And, you know, again, the judge is going to have maybe that subtle bias within their mind in thinking that, ah, oh, God, this person is very interesting and easy to listen to. And so that can highlight your speaking style. Another good example of this, though, is if someone comes up and is very boring, you know, their speech is the, you know, it's all the same tone, it's very quiet, they get up and they say things like, we believe that the economy is important. And, and you know, they do that for seven minutes. That's what they do for seven minutes of it. And if you notice that, if you notice how quiet they were, how there wasn't much energy in their main speech, then you want to walk up here with energy. You want to look like you're energetic and have that speaking style that will be interesting and engaging to listen to. Which is why when you get up here, you're you stand up and you say, we have three points and we are excited to tell you about them. That's what you're trying to convey in a lot of ways. Because afterwards, it looks, the distinction is what's important. The way that you just differentiated yourself from the previous speaker, that might be, that might have been boring or that might have been too loud. 
That's a good way of doing it, is by varying the way that you're going to speak just enough to make it clearer to the judge that you are in fact a more persuasive speaker. Because then it sounds like you're more persuasive because they were just not persuaded by the previous strategy, by the previous speaking voice. Okay. We're going to really talk about two more things and then we're going to finish. And then we're going to be finished and I'll take more questions. If there are any questions. The last two things we're going to talk about are related. And it's the fact that if the debate is messy, you should clarify it. If the judge thinks to themselves that this debate is very messy that they're watching, you know, the arguments aren't engaging in a way that sounds good, that people aren't quite doing what they're supposed to be doing, if you're the debate, if you're the speaker of the debate who makes the round clear, who very, who is able to identify what's going on and what's important, and in some sense, reset the debate to make it clear. This often happens from a member of government speech, in fact. Is that if you're more the leader of opposition for that matter, those are the kind of two, the two speeches where this happens the most. If you're able to be like, okay, this debate is about the government saying this and the opposition saying this. We think these, we think the government says this because, and the opposition says this because. If you're that speaker that is able to make it that clear to the judge, they're going to look upon you favorably. They're going to think that you did something in the debate that hadn't yet been done, and that's to make it clear about what the issues are. In the same way, we're going to talk about the second one, in that if someone has a very complicated analysis that is difficult to understand, then you should make it simpler and at least more easily understand it. And this is also important, because if you make their analysis sound more simple and more understandable, then you're being more persuasive about it. You're going to get more credit for being persuasive even about their arguments. You know, if the judge thinks that, wow, you said their argument better than they said it, then, you know, that's the comparison that they have to make. They say, the leader of opposition made this argument that was difficult to understand, right? And the deputy prime minister repeated that argument in order to refute it, and even the repetition was clearer than what the leader of opposition said. That's good. You want that to happen. You want to be the person who the judge looks upon favorably for what you did in the round. Because you made the debate clear. <coughs> because you provided an important argument. Because you challenged the assumptions that the other side made. Those are persuasive tricks that will allow you to actually be much better and much more persuasive in any debate round. Okay, we'll stop this so that you all can ask questions. <laughs>